Well, thank you for letting me come. Thank you for the, taking my abstract. <coughs> uh, this paper draws two conclusions. The first is that this, it is an hallucination. And the second is that um, it, perhaps we might consider other ways of approaching archaeological explanation. So that's a kind of rough journey plan. So, um, brief introduction, something about the evidence, uh, something about other theoretical approaches, a proposition, and then a conclusion, all in a magical 1800 words. Well now, chronological interpretations of the origins of the English are structured around a chronological breakpoint in the early 5th century and articulated in terms of cause and effect. So there's the withdrawal of Roman administration from Britain leading to a widespread political and economic collapse, what my husband calls disaster, followed by significant Northwest European immigration triggering a fundamental cultural change, which he refers to as salvation. This paper <coughs> proposes an alternative, more holistic model focused on broader mapping of the relative influences, both regional and national, of short and medium term events and processes contextualized by the grande durée, the long, sorry, the long durée. Well, what is the evidence for a breakpoint? There was demographic continuity from prehistoric and Roman Britain into the early Middle Ages and after. I can't unpack all of this, so you can ask me about it after. There's a series of broad conclusions, but I can back it up. It would be surprising had there been no 5th century population movement as there's been consistent migration into and from Britain for millennia. There is no reliable evidence, however, to indicate whether it's 5th century volume character or timing was typical or not, nor for substantive Germanic invasion, settlement or conquest. Contemporary documentary evidence suggests that many late 4th century Romano-British administrative structures, military institutions, social relationships, language, economy and material culture persisted into the 5th century and later. There was no break in agricultural production. And while there was a substantial change in the character of 5th century material culture, there is also growing evidence of the influence of Romano-British artistry and craftsmanship in the evolution of those new forms of artefact from one region to another. The origins of the English language remain controversial. All the evidence certainly shows is the influence of second language speakers on its development. So this is not to argue that nothing happened, but there is no firm evidence for a 5th century fault line. So four scholars and another perspective, each is subject to critique, so <coughs> there, there isn't time to talk about that here. So Brodel argued that the evolution of some aspects of social, political and or economic life was so slow that it was only perceptible across long periods of time, what he called the long durée. The events and processes of each period should, he suggested, be contextualised not only in terms of local geography and culture, but also against that longer time frame there might otherwise be a danger of misinterpreting some changes as contemporary innovations when they were instead evolving adaptations of older forms. Baudel thus com proposed a complex model distinguishing between episodic short-term events and processes, for example, the early 5th century withdrawal of the Roman army admi and administration from Britain, or the Justinian plagues of the mid-5th century, and those that extended across the longer term, like, for example, the early medieval climatic downturn. Some might have immediate and severe consequences for society, economy or polity. The effects of others may have been visible only across the medium or longer term, and the influence of yet others may have dissipated or been absorbed, leaving few medium or long term traces. <coughs> 
Similar models have emerged in sociology, economics and in environmental science. So, Bourdieu, a sociologist, suggested that our unspoken expectations of how we should behave towards others and how we expect them to treat us, what he called habitus, are transmitted from one generation to the next through inarticulate example, gradually evolving from one generation to another. Those expectations structure the outcomes of historical change by providing a complex, intensely conservative framework for distinguishing between those actions that are and those that are not permissible. So it's a version of the longue durée. The Nobel Prize winning economist Eleanor Erström drew comparable conclusions from her analysis of institutions that govern shared property rights in natural resources what are often called rights of common. She suggested that the distinctive principles of equity on which such institutions are constructed frame predictable, inarticulate limits to their objectives, defining what they must, may and may not undertake. Commons and the institutions through which they are governed thus tend to be enduring, selective and stable in mem membership. They are structured for longevity. An example of the long-term adaptive institutional continuity that Rodel described as the long durée. <coughs> there are synergies between Rodel, Bourdieu, and Ostrom, and C. S. Holling's model of panarchy, which proposes. I'll show you. It's got a good diagram. Which proposes that the <coughs> speed of historical change varies at a range of scales, from larger to smaller scale localities communities and collectivities, encouraged or inhibited by the complex dynamic interrelationships between them. Severe weather events, for instance, may have dramatic short-term effects on particular sectors of local social and economic systems. Climate change, on the other, may be a medium-term process whose effects may only be felt in the longer term on a much wider geographic and social and economic scale. A flexible system, Holling suggested, can invent and experiment, benefiting from inventions that create opportunity, while it is kept safe from those that destabilize the system because of their nature or excess excessive exuberance. A more rigid system will be more vulnerable to systemic shock. Which just takes us straight back to your book, James. How might the fifth century be illuminated by such models? Consider the removal of imperial military and, administra and administrative oversight in the early 5th century or the cessation of Roman coin imports. Were these small and fast changes with little long-term impact or were they of intermediate size and speed that they required the adaptation of local institutions? How significant were changes in material culture in these terms? And can social institutions be identified that embody Braudel's vision of the longue durée, Bourdieu's of habitus, Erström's of structures for minimizing institutional risk, and Holling's of the larger, slower cycle whose flexibility and generalizability fa facilitate renewal? If such institutions can be identified in late antiquity, they might provide a wider context against which medium and short term stimulus, response and adaptation might more, more holistically be interpreted and explained. So, the exemplar of this proposition focuses on the rights of property of peasant cultivators on which the stability and sustainability of all aspects of the agricultural economy depended. Property rights were given material expression by their physical boundaries. They were in turn mnemonics for personal and community identities, <coughs> individual and household wealth and status, genealogies and community histories, livelihoods, hierarchies, customary and mythic traditions, the potential to generate a surplus or acquire goods, and for opportunities for personal interaction with elites through tribute, gift giving or taxation. If there was transformative structural change in social relations, economy, or political organization across 5th century England, it might be expected to be reflected in the agricultural landscape. I'm particularly interested, given their potentially indefinite longevity, in institutions governing common rights. 
Well, now prehistoric commons have been identified from Cornwall to the Yorkshire Wolds and the Cheviots, across the chalk downlands of southern England, on coastal marshes, on wetlands and riverine floodplains, as well as on the clay plateau of central, eastern and northeastern England. And this is Peter Herring's work in Cornwall, which shows <coughs> common moorland heath in prehistory as yellow there, remaining pre-common moorland heath well into the modern period. Although there is some theoretical debate about the persistence of common rights after 43 AD, the balance leads, leans towards the view that all prehistoric property rights, including common rights, continued to be recognised and governed under long-standing <coughs> customary traditions through the Roman period. There is little evidence in the 5th and 6th centuries for the widespread abandonment or desertion of shared pastoral resources. Instead, archaeological, palynological, and place name evidence suggests long-term continuity in their exploitation. That conclusion is supported by unquestioning assumptions of private and shared property rights in the early 7th century laws of Ethelbert and the later laws of Ina, both incorporating aspects of Romano-British customary law. Together, the evidence suggests the continuity of common rights and the concomitant persistence of institutions for their governance across the long durée. The implication is the slow incremental evolution across the fifth century and later of definitions of peasant status, social hierarchies and social relationships of which shared property rights were an expression. So, here's an example. The early medieval East Anglian Fen Basin supported the largest area of peat wetland in uh, early medieval England. It was continuously occupied from prehistory into the Middle Ages, that's Roman on the left and early and Middle Anglo-Saxon on the right. Palynological and other evidence demonstrates similarly long-term stability, but not stasis, in the region's wetland ecology, the result of deliberate management of fen grazing in support of dairying and other resources. There is no evidence of 5th century ethnic divisions in material culture, in social relations, for example, in burial patterns, or in language, for example, in place names, as you can see, are e fairly evenly distributed. There is a further implication. Historians argue that there is an intrinsic, re intrinsic relationship between the collective governance of natural resources belonging to entire territories and the polities that gradually evolved into the early medieval kingdom. So this is uh, Ford's work in, uh, the War in, War in Warwickshire uh, around Witchwood, showing how the former territory of the Wiki had been subdivided between Mercia and the Wiki by the uh, early 7th century, I think. Rights of common brought together definitions of a territory, the shared resources of a bounded political unit, with conceptions of stas status on which access to property rights depended, with a belief, real or imagined, that territoriality implied kin kinship, and participation of right holders in territorial governance. So if I should have said that each of these pins represents a, 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 a community home base, and the point of the pin is where they common. So in Finland, the territories of 5th century and perhaps earlier polities were preserved for over 1,500 years in clusters of medieval villes, <coughs> each sharing common rights in discrete areas of the wetland. Structured for survival and adaptability across the long durée, commons thus offer a good example of systems of social behaviour which provide a framework within which the individual can operate, safeguarding on the one hand the structure of the community and thus its power to reproduce itself while providing the individual with carefully circumscribed opportunities for innovation. <coughs> there is little evidence to support the proposition of a 5th century fault line in the Fenland social relations, political authority, economic production, material culture or language, although it is said to be one of the er earliest regions to have been settled. The unbroken histories of commons suggest the slow evolution of prehistoric and later Romano-British shared property rights and territorial organisation 
and their collective governance into the assemblies that framed the late antique kingdoms. That continuity may have given 5th and 6th century political leaders another opportunity to do what Martin Hennig calls dressing up as Romans, whether or not the tradition was in fact Romano-British. The long durée that commons embody provides a foil against which short and medium term events and processes, continuities and innovations of the post-imperial centuries can be set. The adaptation of imperial structures for ad administering localities, the judiciary, the armies and the church. The, spoke, the continued development of the languages of Roman Britain, Britonic and late spoken Latin for conducting that business and regionally variable continuities in Romano-British technology, craftsmanship and design. There was also significant innovation in material culture, in the restructuring of imperial administrative units in a hierarchy of folk territories at a range of scales, in changing expressions of identity and status and evolving social hierarchies, and in the identification by the mid-sixth century of the English-speaking Angli. The degree of continuity and the pace, extent and intensity of ad adaptation and innovation varied by sector, by region and by level of organisational complexity. The men and women who used these new artifactual forms and who spoke English as a second or third language found no conflict in continuing to speak Britonic and late spoken Latin, in living within administrative areas established in the first century AD or before in turning for their defence to legal and military structures explicitly modelled on Roman antecedents, in legitimating political authority in terms of its real or imagined Roman heritage, in running their farms, and in participating in the collective governance of their commons. The models suggested by Brodel, Bourdieu, Ostrom and Hollings suggest the possibility of illuminating what really may have happened in the 5th century, not what Gildas and Bede wanted us to think, nor what unfounded preconceptions and premises might direct us to believe. Exogenous and endogenous short and medium term events, processes and innovations transformed Romano-British into English communities within an evolving framework of long-term continuities. From that perspective, a fifth century fault line is an hallucination.